All right. Hello again. Welcome back to day two of Keyshot World 2020 Virtual Edition. Uh, I'm Derek Cicero, Vice President of Products and Strategy here at Luxion. Um, in case you missed yesterday's session, as with all the sessions, it's going to be posted online. They're streamed to YouTube. And if you go onto our website, you can follow along with the agenda. On the right, you'll see it'll say watch. It'll take you to the YouTube link and everything will be up there. So uh, we'd love to have you watch us live, but if you can't, uh, everything will be recorded for you to watch uh, when it's convenient for you. Uh, yesterday's presentations were great. Uh, it featured What's New in Keyshot 9 with Ryan Levy, which is kind of a great overview of all the things in Keyshot 9. It'll help you kind of set you up for the additional sessions coming uh, this week. And then a wonderful customer presentation by Georgia Larte at Spin Master. Uh, very informative, very humorous. Definitely recommend that you check that out. Uh, congratulations to Jeff Y, who won a GoPro uh, Hero 7 camera. Thank you to the folks at GoPro for providing that. Um, today's sessions are going to be uh, Key Shot Essentials, uh, UI and Workflow with Ryan Levy, uh, and Design and Innovation at Pepsi with Jacob Fine. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention for folks who are working at home, if you need a home license of Keyshot, uh, we are providing them. We understand it's really difficult for folks right now trying to you know, juggle the work from home thing. Uh, if you need a license uh, of Keyshot 9, you have one, it's at your office, you need it for home. Contact your sales rep, they will get you one. If you don't know your sales rep, sales at Luxion.com. So sales at Luxion.com, we're happy to help out uh, any way we can. A uh, quick note about the essentials versus advanced. If you go through our agenda, you'll see some sessions are called essentials, some are advanced. What's that mean? Uh, essentials really kind of walks you through sort of soup to nuts, right? So in essentials for lighting, we're going to walk you through all the different lighting kind of features that are inside of Keyshot for lighting. It's very end to end. Uh, advanced going to go a little deeper dive into certain things like HDRI editor, for example. So it's kind of a, a breadth first step thing. They're all meant for honestly all levels of uh, experience and knowledge. So I think, you know, regardless of where you are in your key shot knowledge, you're going to find uh, the sessions very useful, but wanted to explain kind of what that, that differentiator is. Um, as I mentioned today at noon, Jacob Fine's going to come in and talk about how he's using Keyshot at Pepsi. Uh, we're really fortunate to have Jacob and George and kind of these power users, these power Keyshot users come in uh, and show us just not how Keyshot works, but you know how they use it in their workflow. So a big thank you to them. You're definitely going to want to come back uh, at uh, noon Pacific time and check that out. Uh, today's giveaway is from the Fine folks at 3D Off The Page who run an absolutely wonderful Keyshot render farm, they have provided one week 64 core rental to give away. You heard me correct, one week 64 cores. How fantastic is that? So thank you to the folks at 3D Off The Page. Uh, you'll need to come to the second session and, and participate in the Q&A if you want your chance to win that awesome prize. Um, uh, reminder for social media, you know, follow us on Twitter. We're putting out some cool videos. We're gonna have some quick tips coming later this week. Um, we're gonna keep, continue to push out content, you know, all week long. So please follow us on Twitter, follow us on LinkedIn, join the newsletter so you can see what sessions are coming up. Hashtag uh, Keyshot World. Um, and then again, Render Weekly. We have a contest up right now. We're doing the fun Render Ball uh, that we, you know, use for all of our, kind of our Keyshot World stuff. So have some fun with it, Real Cloth Fuzz displacement, do something fun. We're going to bring, bring another model in next week uh, and have a good time with it. All right, let's, let's have some fun out there. Uh, speaking of fun, let's get to our first session. Uh, this is Keyshot Essentials UI and Workflow with Ryan Levy. Ryan, take it away. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back, day two, virtual Keyshot world. Um, in case you weren't here yesterday, um, just wanted to introduce myself again. My name is Ryan Levy. I'm the global training and creative specialist here at Luxion. Um, you see my email, my LinkedIn, uh, connect with me. Um, try to help you out whenever I can. Um, so let's go over um, a few things, what we're going to cover today, um, obviously it's a user interface and workflow. Um, Derek covered it pretty well. Um, hopefully we'll be able to help you um, get through um, rendering, a, a, you know, making a beautiful render within just a few minutes um, and all the steps to make that happen. Um, today's topics, uh, navigating the Keyshot 9 interface. So we'll talk about some new 
new uh, features in the interface, um, point those out for you. Uh, helpful pr uh, preferences, um, just a couple of things I want to talk about that might help um, speed up uh, your render process. Um, sorry, let me get back. Uh, start to finish rendering with stunning results. So I'll just walk through adding materials, changing a little bit of lighting, um, adjusting pins and HDRI. I'm not going to go too, too far in depth with a lot of these details, but um, this will give you a general uh, walkthrough of what's going on. Um, and render settings, um, just a few helpful things there. So let's get started. What I'm going to do is just launch Keyshot. So you can follow along today. If, if, if you haven't downloaded um, USB stick file that I supplied, um, that's okay. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and open mine up. But if, if you don't have this, um, it's really easy to, to grab. Um, in our cloud library, you'll see a new models tab, and you can just pull anything from here that you like if you open it up and, and download it. But we'll talk about that again in a second. All right, so I'm just going to walk through some of the interface first. Uh, some new things that uh, we've added um, to Keyshot 9. Um, so we'll start up with the ribbon. Um, you'll notice um, another, another button up here that says Tools. And um, you'll, you'll notice a lot of these tools um, are just a lot more easy to access. Um, and whereas before, you know, you would, you would right click on in your real-time view, and you'll see these, these uh, um, tools down here, but this just makes it a lot quicker to, to, uh, to navigate to. So also wanted to show you GPU and denoise. That's up here as well, these two buttons. Now, the fact that I'm on such a beast machine, I'm going to run GPU for, for this uh, demonstration. Um, so we'll use that. And then also, um, just a helpful um, hint here, um, if you go into workspaces, you'll see this drop down. We've added a, a few more um, preset workspaces, such as animation and a few others. But um, a helpful uh, thing to do here is, is to create your own workspace. So um, you can name this anything you want. I'm going to call this Ryan Workspace. Push OK, and you'll see that that has been added. So you can make changes to that as well. Um, I also want to note, you know, another way to customize this, this space is to drag and drop these windows. So you can make adjustments that way. And then save your, save your workspace that way. So that's really helpful. Um, you'll notice in the library window, uh, there's a new models tab. So if I click that, I'll see a lot of those pre-made geometry um, files that you might be familiar with from before. Um, so you can look through those and get to um, you know, starting your scenes with those if needed. And we will be using one of these today. Um, so uh, while I'm in here, actually, if I go to my materials tab, um, here's our list of materials pre-made for Keyshot. Um, a helpful um, button here is to use list view. So you'll notice that you know sometimes it's kind of hard to read um, these descriptions. So you hover over and see these descriptions. But if I hit list view, that really cleans that up for me. I, I tend to do this all the time. So um, if you can use that, go ahead and use it. Um, it should help with your with your finding of these materials faster. Um, as I touched on earlier, the Cloud Library, we've updated this to have this materials tab. A lot of these models are just so awesome. Um, you can use these for helping visualize scenes if, if you need to, or scale, um, just bringing your, your renders to life. Um, and, and all of these uh, models come with the materials applied. So they're just drag and drop, work with them as they are, or make adjustments to them. Um, very helpful there. Um, I also want to touch on some preferences before we get started here. Um, so in edit preferences, or if you're on a Mac, it might be file preferences. Um, but under preferences, if I go here, 
Um, there's there's a lot of customization in here, so I, I you know I, I recommend you going through, through here and making any adjustments as needed. But I'm going to go to the Generals tab. Um, under this tab, you'll see Screenshot. Um, you can change any of these settings, um, file types. Um, I tend to keep PNG selected for zero loss uh, or, or compression, so it keeps a lot of those colors for you. Um, and also, we, we have uh, alpha transparency available for screenshots as well. And um, I tend to turn off save camera with each screenshot, but that's totally your preference. Um, so one other thing I want to mention in here is uh, default startup scene. Uh, this is helpful for if you're, you know, just trying to speed up, you know, opening and get, getting to work on your renders. Um, you can build um, a T-shot file that has maybe pre-made pre cameras or environments or um, anything to that nature so you don't have to rebuild that every time you get into the shot. All right, uh, a couple more things I want to mention uh, is the K key. You hit K on the keyboard, you'll get this hot keys menu and this is very helpful for, for learning the ins and outs and how to navigate a lot quicker through P-Shot. Um, so actually I've printed this out. I keep this near me quite a bit. Um, so that's helpful too. Um, if you'll notice down here at the bottom, you'll see setup and details. If you hit that button, you can customize all of these hotkeys um, to your liking. Um, nothing's you know, set in stone here. So, so definitely go in there and, and check that out. See whatever you, know, you can change for your own um, speed uh, of rendering. So, um, also in here, you'll notice camera control. So if you're using a specific modeling software, um, you can select any of these uh, that we have in here to, to mimic those camera controls. So you don't have to you know, feel lost kind of relearning uh, a, a way to navigate through your real-time view. So that's very helpful as well. All right, let's get started making a, a scene. Um, so I've gone ahead, like I mentioned before, I went ahead, opened my keyshot file. Um, and what I tend to do first out of before any other step is change my environment. And the reason I do that is because when you have a consistent environment that you're using to build materials or, or, or textures or putting, putting textures on your materials, um, a consistent lighting source will help um, visually, you know, getting that consistent um, feel to your to your textures and, and reflectivities and everything like that. So if you're using different HDRIs, um, you know that's going to affect shadows and 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 reflectivities and and, and color on your on your materials. So I'm going to stick with um, one that I like, which is three panels, uh, tilted 4K, but it's totally up to you, however you want to start. This gives a nice balance of light for me. Um, obviously, right now, these are just diffuse materials, so you're not going to really get that full effect. Um, so now that we have our HDRI set, um, oh, and I just want to mention, uh, Kareem, I believe it is next Wednesday, he's going to be going over a lot more of the lighting techniques, um, more physical lighting and, and uh, details to that nature. So you've got to check in on that one as well, because he's, he's very knowledgeable in that area. So he'll be helping you out a lot there. Um, so let's go ahead and start with some materials. So a lot of the presets in, in P-Shot are, are actually really awesome. So I tend to use those a lot and then build on them from there. Um, for this particular render, I want to use a plastic um, and then possibly a metal here, maybe metal here, and then make this um, housing a plastic housing. So let me just find one um, in my plastic drop down here. Uh, let's see, let's just do a shiny um, black plastic. We'll drag this onto um, this housing. And notice that it just changed 
this one um, part, right? Because these these colors separated these parts. They're not linked. Um, so when I were to drag a material to this, it just affected this one part. And I must note in the scene tree, it's good to and, and very helpful to have this organized. Um, and, and this can be organized through your modeling software, software, or you can go through PShot and uh, really kind of put these together for yourself. Um, so this is very helpful for navigation. All right, back to adding some materials. Um, let's add a shiny plastic red to this kind of like metal cover that slides over the USB stick. Uh, let's go to a metal. I'm going to pick like a maybe a rough aluminum. Let's see how that looks. Um, aluminum textured. Let's just drag that on there. Cool. Now, um, let's see. Uh, let's go ahead and double click on a material. So you'll see when you do that, um, your materials properties opens up in your project window. And this is a great area to really start to adjust these materials and make changes to them. Um, so I'm not going to go too far um, into this. Um, but I do want to share a few of these details. Um, so one of the um, settings here is roughness. So I just want to adjust this a little bit. Um, and you'll see how that makes a difference there in the reflectivities. Um, I'm going to go through and make some adjustments to all these materials. So I'm just going to do a little bit of roughness here as well. 0 0.02. Well, actually, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Just a little bit of you know, roughness on that metal. Um, I'll make some adjustments to this uh, plug right here. Cool. Pretty happy with that. Um, next step here I want to do is I actually want to put this into a scene rather than having it kind of like a floating object, um, which is totally fine if you're going for that. Um, but I just want to build out a scene, maybe add some lighting to this. So um, first thing I want to do is go into my, my models tab. I'm just going to grab a plane. I'm going to make this my, my floor. So what you can do is just double click that. Give that a second to drop in. You can also just drag this over if you'd like as well. So once you pull that into your scene, it's actually, it's in there. It's just a little smaller right now. Um, but this little dialog box will pop up. I want to check scale so then I can make adjustments and you'll see this little yellow square right down here. So I'm going to push, I'm going to actually click that and drag. And you'll see that expanding and keeping its uh, scaling um, uniform as well. So I'm going to just fill that scene. Push OK. I'm pretty happy with that. Cool. And now that I have you know, pretty much all my, my assets in my scene that I want, I'm going to go into my cameras tab. I want to set a camera for this. Um, what we're going to do here is just, we have our free camera right now that's by default, but I want to add a new camera to this. And by default, it says camera one, but you can change that to anything you'd like. Um, I'm also going to lock this camera which is a great function because if you're making changes uh, in free camera and let's say you, you know, come in really close to work on some materials, you click camera, it snaps right back to your save. Now, if I uncheck un, uh, that, that lock on the camera, uh, that save camera, you'll see a, a plenty of, of uh, adjustments you can make in here. Um, including camera settings here, like distance, azimuth, inclination, azimuth is just like kind of a circular um, rotation. Um, but you'll see when I make adjustments by clicking in my real time that these are changing as well. So I'm pretty happy with that, that view right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that camera. So those adjustments have been made, it's saved. Um, a few other things in here that I wanna point out is 
there's some standard views in here, front, back, left, right, and so forth. So you can you can use these as well um, if you're doing any standard views. Um, turning on grids, um, this helps you know set up visually you know how your scene is laid out. This is very helpful too. I use that quite a bit. Um, also changing lens settings. So by default it's at 50 millimeters. So these are really representative of, of real world camera lenses. So if I had you know 82 millimeter. It's going to give me a little bit more of that form factor in my render, um, rather than more of a, you know, the lower the millimeter, you know, the more distorted it is or wide angle. Let me go ahead and save that camera. So now that I'm pretty happy with this, um, there are a few more settings down here that I want to add on to here. So actually, depth of field is another. Uh, really powerful tool, I think, for realism and bringing this to life. So um, once I hit this checkbox, by default, it's going to set it to an f-stop of one, which is a really shallow depth of field. But I want to make adjustments to this. So if you click this little bullseye and you just click anywhere in your scene, the lens is going to look at that specific spot. So I click up here, somewhere closer to the camera. And if I change that f-stop to something a little bit higher, maybe 10, you'll see that fall off kind of um, soften towards the back and not so much up front. So I'm going to bring this actually maybe to 15. And once you're happy with that, push done right here, and then save that camera again. So now that we have our camera set, we're pretty happy with that. Um, I actually want to jump back uh, quickly and make adjustments to my to my surface, my ground here. So um, in this case, what I want to do is I want this this ground plane to have the same material as as this uh, black housing here. So a quick way to link these materials is holding shift and left clicking on a material, and then holding shift and right clicking on another part. So now these materials are linked. Um, so you don't have to work that way, um, but there are really a lot of benefits to linking materials as far as speeds. Let's say I want to make a change to, to this um, plastic housing, and you know I don't have to go through my whole scene and make those adjustments each time. Um, so they will correlate. Um, in this case, I actually want to unlink this this ground plane now. So what I do is I just right click on that part, and up here I hit unlink material. So let's make some adjustments to this ground plane as well. So now I just double click that. Um, we already have some good settings here. If I go into textures, um, now you have some some a little bit more play with this with this specific texture. You'll see diffuse specular bump and opacity, but today I'm just going to adjust some of the, the bump on this to give it a little bit more depth and a little bit more realism there. So if I select bump, you can double click and bring in your own um, bump map if you'd like. However, uh, using our preset uh, procedural textures are really powerful and I tend to use these a lot. So um, I actually, so I just hit this textures tab go down to noise texture, which is great for plastics or anything to that nature, maybe metals as well. Um, by default, this is set to 10. And you can see it's it's a little um, kind of a odd kind of look right there. So I'm just going to make some adjustments to the scale of that texture. So I'll go to maybe two millimeters. And you'll start to see that you know come, come to life a little bit more there. You can also adjust the height of these bumps. And remember that the bump is a it's a camera trick, really. It's it's not adjusting any ge geometry or anything like that. Um, so take note of that. All right, now that we're happy with our materials, uh, let's move into lighting. So if I hit Actually, let's do this. I want to talk about lighting really quickly. So in the lighting tab in the project window, 
you'll see by default again it's set to basic which uh, works pretty well um, you're going to get a lot of the shadows and reflections that you might be looking for um, i tend to work in product mode a little bit more because you'll notice some of these check boxes enabled down here um, like global illumination and the shadow quality um, bumps up a little bit that's going to give you let me just shuffle back between these, you'll see a little bit more reflections, a little bit more realism um, in, in your scene there. So I just wanted to take note of that really quickly. Um, so let's jump into environment tab. So we've we've placed this HDRI um, from before. And keep in mind also that all of these HDRIs that we have are procedural. So you can make adjustments to these. As you go um, and then save these out if you want as well and i'll show you that in a second as well so um, you can make some adjustments um, to the overall hdi hdri within these settings um, such as brightness or contrast i tend to keep these um, where they are for the most part um, because i make most of my adjustments in the editor um, so let's go ahead and go in here so you'll see that these pins since they're created already for us, um, are in this window. So you can turn these off, turn them on, um, make adjustments to any particular uh, pin that you like. Um, and you can also add new pins. So all I did is I hit this little button right here, this add pin. And you'll see by default it's added this, you know, this little set highlight um, bullseye has become uh, illuminated. And now, with this pin um, editable, I can really I can just click anywhere in my scene and start to add highlights or shadows um, any which way I'd like. So I'm just going to build out a few of these pins here. So I just click on the surface, get some light behind um, this USB stick. Um, I'm going to add another pin. Uh, click over here. So we're going to put my little bullseye here again. Click over here, get some light over there, maybe change the color of this to more of a blue tint. Let's go a little bit more blue, maybe bump up brightness. Start to see that come through. And also click and drag these lights as well. So you'll start to see that light really kind of kick in over here. Um, I'm going to add another pin, maybe punch it over here, see how that looks. I'm going to change that um, color again to maybe more than orange tint. And I'm going to bump up that brightness quite a bit. So you see that come, come through there. It's more of like a, maybe a daylight type of, of lighting there. So I'm going to push OK there. Um, also, keep, keep in mind that when you're making adjustments to these pins, if you want to click and drag them, you can hold shift and keep that linear. So it's not really a free form drag. You can just keep that linear, not only horizontal, but vertical as well. I'm going to bring that up here, maybe get some more daylight kind of effect there. So now that I have that all set, I'm pretty happy with that lighting. Um, I'm noticing that it's, it's a little shallow. I mean, it's a little soft for me. It's a little too, it's not as contrasty as I'd like. Um, so if I do want to make adjustments to that, I tend to use, actually, I use the image, image tab every time I render um, and setting my in, image styles for each render that I do. So, and, and also this is not destructive, you know, it doesn't, it's not destructive. So any changes you make in here can be um, changed or, or turned off. Um, it's not going to affect your, your overall render. Um, it's just um, kind of looking at the uh, the over, it's basically on top of your render. So um, we have some basic settings in here, exposures, um, setting blooms. Um, this is great for anything that's illuminated in your scene. You'll see that this kind of brings out um, more softness. As you can see in these really bright highlights here, um, you can bump that threshold way up. So you'll just get that bloom effect more on the illuminated, illuminated areas there. Um, so actually for this render, I'm just going to turn that off. 
Um, we also have chromatic aberration. This is a cool one as well. It kind of brings in more realism in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of natural lens effect that might give you um, some of this RGB breaking in, in the edges. So you'll see if I drag this over here and I bump my aberration up to maybe three, just for this example, you see that kind of like cool um, lens type effect. Um, to your render. So that's great for like, I use this a lot for macro shots or things of that nature. So I'm actually going to turn that off. If I want to go back to my original camera setting, obviously we've saved this camera before. Um, actually, I don't want to save that. Um, but we did save our camera before. So if I just go back, click that camera, let's say it was over here, and I hit that, it snapped right back. So it's very helpful. So back in our Im image tab, we'll notice also a, a photographic setting. So if you click that, this will give you a lot more adjustment um, availability, um, such as curve. Uh, I tend to use this a lot as well. So when you click that, you can click and drag these uh, shadows and highlights to really bring out um, you know, a little bit more depth in your render. So you can really get you know, creative with this. Um, so that is something I, I recommend um, working with if, if, um, if you need to really bring out that extra detail in your render. Um, so now that we've made some adjustments there, I just want to, you know, point out that you can you can add different image styles. You can go back and forth. Um, so, and, and this really um, demonstrates that, you know, this is non-destructive. Great. So now that we've gone over some image settings, um, next thing I want to talk about is render output. So let's say we're happy with our image. We might have taken some screenshots, sent those to clients or, or creative directors or whoever it might be, and we've gotten the, the go ahead to get this rendered out. Um, so if we hit the render button down at the bottom, um, this dialog box will pop up. You'll see that we have different render settings. We can do stills, animation, Keyshot XR, configurator. There's a lot of, a lot of different um, ways to get that image out. Um, so you can name um, this render. Um, so it's good to keep that categorized uh, any which way you can. Uh, I'm going to be sending this render to my resources folder, Keyshot 9. Um, but you can select any, any uh, folders that you'd like to send that to as well. Um, you'll notice format, um, you get all of these great options here. Um, PSDs, PNGs, TIFFs, um, more compressed images like JPEGs, if you're sending these, you know, if, if, if you want a small file type, I'm gonna stick with PNG. And then here's that alpha um, option again. So in here, in resolution, if I were to make adjustments to this, um, this will correlate with um, the resolutions that are set in your image tab. So if I were to set this to 16 by 9, which it is here, um, it'll, these will stick to that resolution. Um, so these, these correlate. Keep that in mind as well. So I can bump this up. It's still a 16 by 9 resolution. So I'm going to keep that at 1920 by 1080. Um, let's look at layers and passes. So these are helpful for any kind of post-production that you might be doing. Um, in the past, I've used clown quite a bit, which kind of gives you multiple colors on different surfaces. So you can make selections and make adjustments to those specific parts. Um, in other settings like depth and normals, shadows. Um, so that's great to have all of these options. And, and this list has grown over time. So it's, it's been great to see that. So I um, also want to point out, if you were to check a lot of these boxes, right, and you want to you wanna export these out along with the render, if you go to PSD, um, these will, will layer in the PSD. 
So it's all combined in that in that one file. I'm going to uncheck these. So another another point here, uh, something to always remember if you're if you're building out um, detailed materials, um, to use region render. Now region render is not just available in the render settings. You can use that up here in the ribbon as well. So uh, one of the main benefits I use region render is because if I am going in closely, let's actually adjust our camera so we don't have let's go to free camera, turn off depth of field. If you're making any adjustments to um, really detailed um, textures, um, the real-time view is not going to look at anything else outside of that region render. It's just going to focus all the computing power within this window. Um, so, so that's a really speedy way and an accurate way to build your materials. I'm going to turn off region, hit my camera one, bring me back to what I uh, originally created there. And uh, I want to go into options. Let's look at options here. So you'll notice three different types of uh, options here for, for quality. Um, sometimes it's good to stick with maximum renders just because this represents what you're seeing in the real time view. Um, so if I were to go to custom control, you'll see there, there's a lot of adjustments that you can make um, to customize your, your output here. Um, and that's totally fine too if you have these tuned up and you know exactly what you need to get out of your render, go ahead and use this. I tend to use this quite a bit. And you'll notice sample rate. Sample rates um, determine, um, I guess, if, if you think of it kind of like pixelation in, in uh, Photoshop or something like that, um, the higher the sample rate, the, uh, the cleaner those, those um, the higher fidelity really um, that that image will take on. So you also notice uh, I have this this uh, what's called as a heads up display in my real time view. Um, I tend to keep that on as well because it helps me um, really get an understanding of how many samples are building in this scene. It's a good reference to to use for for how many samples you want to output with. And to pull this um, heads up display up, it's just H on the keyboard. So I keep that up all the time, really. And while I'm in here, uh, I wanted to show you if you hit Z on the keyboard, it's great to have the coordinate legend up as well. This helps you navigate your scene. And now your ups and downs and left to rights and all that. So very helpful. Um, so moving on, let's go to Q, render Q. So this is another helpful tool I use quite a bit. So if you want to build up another you know, uh, scene using different camera angles or, or um, different materials or um, different lens settings or things like that, you can add these jobs into your, into your Q and just start building up this list. And once you have all these and you process that, it's going to process all of those renders. So it's not going to, you don't have to go back, make changes, send it in. Um, you, can, you can just select also by cameras, model sets, which we'll go over next week, um, studios, again, we'll go over that next week, and multi materials. Um, it's just a really helpful way to speed up all of these render processes. So it looks like we have a couple minutes left. I want to show uh, maybe a few tricks here or a few helpful hints. Um, let's go over, let's do the pattern tool really quickly. Let's say I'm gonna go to my free camera, turn off depth of field. I just wanna show you how this works. This is really helpful. Actually, just an example of when I've used this was um, um, creating ice in a, in a cooler just to get multiple um, uh, sets of geometry. So if you just right click on your, uh, I'm gonna right click on my top level assembly here and I go to make pattern. So this dialog box pops up and you can start to make some adjustments here. So bringing in 
all these you know new um, pieces of geometry um, and you can start to make adjustments to these as well um, from spacing you can also add some some scattering to this so they're not all uniform um, so this is a really cool tool um, so i just wanted to show you that as well and um i think i think that's pretty much it now i think we should start to take some questions and if you have any other questions um, or any questions, I'm, I'm happy to help you. And if I can't get to it today um, or at this, during this session, um, reach out to me directly and um, I'll help you figure it out. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. Can you hear me yeah. okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Well, that, that was a great presentation. Thank you for the overview. Uh, just so folks know, we did have a little bit of an issue in the beginning. Um, just with some some of the, the, the settings. So uh, I, I think it cleared up once it kind of got about 10 minutes in. So we'll take a look and see if we can resolve that uh, maybe on the, the YouTube stream. Uh, but some questions for you, Ryan. Um, one question is, is it possible to save the highlights from a glossy surface as a separate layer when rendering? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, is it possible to save the highlights from a glossy surface as a separate layer when you're rendering? Hmm. Separate layer as in in Keyshot or one of your... Um... Uh, as in like one of the PSD layers. Yes. So um, you're in here, if, if I'm hearing that correctly. Um, and what was the passage exactly? Basically, I wanted the, the, um, just the highlight from a glossy surface. So if you want to just basically, I guess, kind of like where like the you know, uh, kind of have you the the you have sort of the the cover there for the USB. Is there mm -hmm. a way to just get just get that exactly get that out as, as a, a separate section? Um, let's. Um, I might want to come back to that question. Okay. Um, or reach out to them directly. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll definitely. I'm there for that. Okay. Um, how do you apply a clear coat to a material like like a lacquer on a wood? Um, that's a good question. Um, so there's a few ways to do that. Um, I would uh, use um, labels for that. So if I'm in my materials tab and double click on a material, and go into my labels, I'd add um, basically layering materials on top of each other and do something that's uh, you know some type of translucent looking material or shiny material on top of that. Okay, and, and can you actually add a logo to that? So some folks were asking, you know, how, sure. how easy is it to kind of throw a logo on that? Sure, let's um, go to a free camera, just so I can show you this really quickly. Um, so I'm going to double click this part, and within labels, um, you can add um, label texture. Um, so I'm going to just hit this button here. Um, you can pull in your own, your own labels. Or uh, just for this example, I'm just going to show uh, what do we have? Keyshot labels. So, so what I'll do is I can just click and drag, pull that over into that window there, or just drag it on top of that part and add label, and then make adjustments from there. So, and, and also keep in mind that these labels are fully adjustable as well. So, you can you know change properties of roughness and things like that that I talked about earlier. And, um, and and really take this to the next step. Awesome, thank you. Uh, is there a way to edit the size of a ground plane after creating it? Yes. So um, let's say um, this ground plane here that I've created, um, I wanna make adjustments to the scale of this. So in my um, scene window, um, you'll see that this plane has been added in here. So you can make adjustments um in the scale uh, which is in position down in these properties so you can just bring this down if you'd like um let's knock this to like i don't know 200 or 150 so you can make adjustments there awesome thank you mm -hmm. uh, so folks are asking about the render queue uh setting um the the or the, the render queue management screen so I was sure. asking if, if the render time is for the whole list for each rendering, and the answer is each one would be separate. So, so each right. job that you're sending out would have its own uh, individual um, parameters that you'd be sending off to, to the network. Exactly. Uh, 
someone is it possible to save job Q in a key shop file? I'm not 100% sure what that means. Do you know what that I might think, mean? I think what, um, and, and I, I, what I think happens here is when these, when these jobs are saved in your queue, these files are saved in your resources file um, or folder. So these are looking into resources um, as like temporary files. They're not saved with your key shop file. Let's say I opened another key shop file of a different product or something like that, and I went into my queue, I would still see this USB. So these are these are queued up in another folder and not saved with that particular file. Okay, great. Uh, someone asking, is there a way to precisely place a part in Keyshot 9? So basically, I guess they're saying like, type, you know, use the actual, instead of just sort of doing it manually by hand, typing right. in numbers. Yeah, so I think that's kind of where you are there. Right. So this is where this is where you would do that. So instead of just moving your object uh, manually, um, you can type in parameters here to make those adjustments. Great. Uh, people are really uh, we're really curious for the patterning tool. Uh, we're gonna right. have a quick tip out later this week on the pattern tool uh, that will show that in more detail. So happy to <coughs> see that people are liking that. Um, someone's asking, they have a coiled water hose and they want to add a mesh to represent the threading and the mesh does not wrap around the hose correctly. It warps on the parts instead of following the coiling. How would you recommend accomplishing this? Um, obviously it's difficult without seeing the models to always know, but I suspect that he, what he um, needs is, is to uh, UV unwrap that uh, water hose to get, um, get that fixed, Ryan. That's exactly right. So this is not a complex shape right here that I pulled in and, and this, this whole USB is not, but that, that water hose is. So this is the tool you would use, unwrap, um, UV unwrap. So um, uh, I think if, if you reach out to me, I can help walk, walk you through that, but we also have a quick tip for that um, that kind of helps you walk through that, but um, that's a really good question. And you know, if you're using other mapping types, yeah, you're gonna see consistency with that. Yeah, I'd really recommend for everyone who is kind of online now or on the YouTube to definitely check out our full YouTube channel. We have a ton of quick tips and, and feature videos that really dig in uh, to detail as well as available on our support uh, site as well with links to that. So yeah, we have a ton of content around Keyshot 9 kind of helping people uh, unpack these great features. So, so please check that out. Uh, some folks are asking about things like model sets and, and labels. Uh, mm -hmm. Please take a look at the agenda, um, you know, as we kind of get, get deeper into this. We're definitely going to have a lot of sessions that are going to be deeper dives on the specific features. Uh, so definitely take a look at those and, and, and see. We obviously don't want to jump into all of those, um, you know, right now, but, but, but definitely have a look at that. Uh, someone's asking if it's possible to edit the job after it's sent to the queue, i.e. the samples, the name, et cetera. No, once it's sent to the queue, it is off to the queue. So you would need to delete that job uh, and resubmit that job. Exactly. Um, do video labels work similar to image labels? How do you export and render a view with video labels? So, good question. So I, when I'm using video labels, I tend to use them for lighting effects or or also applying those video labels to maybe um, uh, some kind of displacement effect to show an animation of that displacement moving. Um, so ha the question was how to export them? Yes, I believe so. How do you export and render a view with video labels? So I, I yeah. Hmm. I'm well, assuming it's an animation. So some of these, you know, j just so, um, Feel free to also post these on our form as well, where we can potentially, you know, if you can sort of show examples, uh, we can definitely jump in and probably give a little more guidance on specifically what you're trying to accomplish uh, on, on some of these questions. Yeah, and just to jump back into this, adding a video label, um, I'm going to be going over that on Friday as well for advanced animation, but um, what it does is you bring in either a video file or a PNG sequence or some kind of sequence of images, and it applies in, into this labels folder. So um, 
I'll go in, into that more on Friday. Okay, that's a good great. question. I'm, I'm glad that they're interested in that. Some folks are asking, you know, the advantages of, of PNG versus, uh, you know, uh, PSD. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously, it's gonna, it's going to depend on what your use case is. Do you, do you have any kind of hard and fast rules for folks on that, Ryan? Yeah, so um, I tend to use PNGs all the time, but it's really up to the user. Uh, JPEGs are great for, you know, they're a little bit more compressed, but they are really lightweight um, image files. Um, PSDs are tend to be, you know, no loss in, in color comp compression or anything like that as well. And TIFFs, TIFFs are great. They're a little bit larger files, but you're gonna keep a lot of that information, uh, color information, and, and you're not gonna get any loss in that. So, um, like I said before, I tend to stick with PNG, um, but it's totally up to you. If you're just sending a bunch of images out and, you know, there's not a lot of space on a hard drive or something like that, you know, JPEGs work great. Thank you. Someone's asking if they can send one camera setting to render while working on other cameras. Um, so I think what they're asking is basically, you know, you, you can't essentially fire off to a network render, uh, you know, a, an offline render, if you will, for that camera and then maintain working inside of, of Keyshot. Um, but you would have to fire that off to, you know, an, another machine to actually fulfill that render. Right. Um, or, or background render. Yeah. So we can talk exactly. like that. Yeah, yeah, and if you if, if you know if your machine is you know running it you know maybe a little bit you know if you have quite a bit of CPU power or GPU power um, you know running this in the background works you know great so um, so that is a good way to do that as well. Uh, and I've heard this before. Some folks are saying when you um, rotate a part or snap it to the ground, it doesn't actually snap to the lowest part of the ground. Um, that might have to do with their geometry. Um, let's say I move this part up and um, let's say I want to snap it to lower object or snap to ground. I just snap this one to ground. I think that might have a lot to do with their, their geometry. Um, it's going to look at the, the, the parts, um, pretty much how they were created in, in, um, in uh, the modeling software. But I, I've run into that as well. Some folks were asking about denoise um, and kind of how often you use denoise. If you want to kind of put that oh, on. Wait. You know what? I, can, can I thank them personally? Thank you for bringing that up. I should have mentioned this a little bit clearer before. Um, this is a huge feature in Keyshot 9. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. I use denoise quite a bit. And the reason I do is because um, just an example is, is when I'm sending an animation or a really high resolution or large file to render, denoise is gonna help smooth out a lot of those pixels. Um, so you can get you know, that high fidelity look a lot faster. And you'll see it's kind of soft in the beginning as it starts to build up these, these um, samples. And, and uh, in your image tab, you can also um, go to your denoise dropdown and make adjustments to that blend. So how much of a blend do you want, how much of smoothing of those pixels or um, those samples you need. So um, denoise is very powerful, not just for stills, but for animation as well. So it's really, for me, it, it knocks down a lot of the render time. Um, so that's when I tend to use it quite a bit, but also for, for more advanced materials, like I mentioned yesterday um, in the What's New presentation, um, if you're doing like scattering medium, you're gonna see um, that effect really smooth out and uh, it, it's just very helpful for that. And someone's asking, is there an easy way to kind of scroll through the different uh, views? I assume they mean the cameras. Their example sure. is in SOLIDWORKS, you can kind of, you know, scroll through. What's, what's sort of your easiest way to kind of just scroll through the cameras for folks? Yeah, so if, you're, if you have a bunch of cameras, right? Let's say we make some changes here. We just, you know, some different types of views. Obviously these aren't looking too Pretty, I apologize that I, I would think these out a little bit, little bit clearer, but uh, let's just make some adjustments here um, just for an example. So um, quick way to just shuffle through these is just to click through your cameras or um, also your cameras are represented into your uh, scene tree. So you'll see those cameras drop down. You can also click through these um, as well. So um, 
those are just a few ways to do that. Yep. And so when the, um, if you kind of see in there, the, the actual label is projecting on both sides of the item. Mm -hmm. uh, so how, how do you solve that problem? You just kind of just want it on that top piece. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of good content out there for that. So, but I'll run through this really quickly. If you double click that part and go into your labels, make sure that that label is selected. And in your properties, um, if you scroll down, you'll see there's a two-sided setting here. So what that's gonna do is turn, turn that two-sided off. So what's happening here is that the depth of this label is um, you know, protruding through like a lot you know, deeper. However, it took it off the back of this object, but you would have to make some adjustments to depth. Uh, what one gentleman was asking, and I certainly understand this question, uh, that the machine you're using is very powerful. <laughs> How to get those same results with lower performance machines? Uh, unfortunately, there really isn't a, a good answer. Uh, you know, the, the, the more you spend on the CPU or GPU, the better performance you're going to get. Uh, obviously, the big thing with KeyShot now with 9 is you do have the GPU or CPU option. So if you want to add a GPU, um, you know, you can kind of get additional performance that way on an older machine. Um, and now if you want to show performance mode real quick, Ryan, sure, but yeah. that's one way for folks, you know, one, one thing you can do inside a KeyShot is just operate in performance mode. And that, that kind of allows you to, um, you know, basically do a lot of the the decision making and look and feel uh, very quickly. And then obviously you can always kind of up res when you're kind of need to make more detailed decisions. Right. Um, so that's kind of how we've, we've made a little here from a workflow standpoint. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ryan. Yeah, just a real quick thing to add to that. So if you are working with a heavy scene or a lot of you know heavy materials or an animation, um, a good way to work through that scene and make adjustments um, is actually through the geometry view. So this is, you know, there, you're not seeing any shadows or any depthy materials. Um, this is a great way to make adjustments um, as well. So anything that you do in here, um, let's say I want to make changes, in, you know, um, uh, you know, you, you can do that in here as well. Um, one, what, one person's asking, you know, when does denoise not work great? Uh, I've had some textures come out blurry or wavy with denoise on. Is that to be expected? Um, yeah, I mean, the whole idea of denoise is it's really going to help you, um, you know, operate much quicker. Obviously, in the sort of that bumpy texture or, you know, the, the more detail you have on an object, denoise is going to kind of clean, you know, kind of smooth that out, which mm -hmm. is great when you're kind of making quick decisions. But obviously, when you want to make those final decisions, um, you know, you, you kind of want to want to maybe operate denoise off. So I would think exactly. that denoise is really... Um, a, a speeding up your workflow type of a of a, um, an option. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ryan. No, that's that's exactly right. And and I tend to use denoise towards the end of my rendering process. But um, let's say you wanted to just test it out for a render that you're working on. It's good to turn on, let those samples build up a little bit, uh, just to preview kind of what that final output would look like. Um, and and the developers might beat me up for this, but I think the way denoise works, is it's, it's really under the hood. I, I can't explain it too much. I think that they will, um, you know, someone might mention that this week or next week, but um, it's not a filter. It doesn't work like that. It, it's, it's smarter than that. It's really working under the hood. Awesome. Well, we're at the top of the hour here. We've answered most of the questions. Um, a few of the other questions that are out there are really very specific to things like lighting and the configurator. Um, yeah. I certainly don't want to kind of steal the thunder from our other presenters. Yeah. Uh, so I'd recommend for folks, if you need kind of an immediate question, obviously, like I said, you can, you can get a lot of information on the YouTube videos. But, but please take a look at the full agenda. We have a ton more workshops coming. Um, we're only on day two. We've got seven more great days of, of content coming to folks. So please take a look at the agenda. Um, if you're really interested in things like, like lighting or the configurator, um, I think you'll find a lot of great information uh, on that agenda and, and please come back for additional presentations. Um, I wanna thank Ryan again for his presentation today. A wonderful job, Ryan. Uh, any, any parting words for, for folks out there? No, I'm just excited to be here for the next two weeks. And it's awesome that we're we're doing all this. Awesome. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And uh, reminder, our next session today is at noon with Jacob Fine. 
uh, and that is design innovation at Pepsi utilizing Keyshot. Uh, it's a great way to sort of see how Jacob is using Keyshot hands-on in his workflow every day at Pepsi. Uh, I thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Thank you everyone.